just wanted to see what the real untouched water is like. On the southwest coast of Africa lies a land of stark beauty. With every texture obscured under a white hot sun, the unrelenting heat and dryness emits the beauty of a past forgotten time. Unchanged for centuries, the incredible space and silence has longfully lingered on. It seems strange that such a barren, inhospitable landscape could form the backdrop to one of the world's true natural mysteries, the wild desert horses of the Namibia. Defiant to a horse's natural habitat, these herds have roamed the region about for the past 80 years, a man-made waterhole providing their only source of replenishment. After a fierce drought in 1992, a 50-strong herd was relocated to a reserve some 300 kilometers southeast of their original home. Thought to be descended from the horses of the German Schutztruppe of the early 1900s, they embody the image of mysticism, braving the elements and living out the ultimate ingrained perception of freedom, sand, silence and solitude. Far away from the sand-sculpted desert, there is a woman who loves horses. Lambourne is a small village nestled in central England, a perfect setting for the strong culture of horsemanship that prevails throughout the area. Kelly Marks calls this home, a remarkably humble life for a woman who possesses such a fiery passion. Lifetime protege of the famous American horse whisperer Monty Roberts, she has dedicated her life to challenging the intimate bonds existing between horses and humans. Her dream? To whisper a wild Namibian horse. I don't really know what to expect with the wild horses. That's half the point of going out there to uh, see the differences between them and the domesticated horses. However, I have studied as far as I'm able to. I'm just going to go and find out. Kelly's involvement with horses thread through most of her life. With various horse racing and show jumping awards already under her belt, it seems natural to advance to an even greater challenge. Horse whispering is a term I think that came around in the 1800s, used to describe people that were thought to have special powers with horses. I think nowadays we know it's not really about special powers or special charms, but about talking to the horse in their own language, really understanding the horse and what they need from us. In 1993, she found a tutor in Monty Roberts, the mastermind behind horse psychology. Together, they set out to promote the understanding and fair treatment of horses worldwide. My father was a trainer, a traditional trainer. And if you were to quantify what his work was like, you'd have to say he was on the strongest end of traditional training. And the things that he did to horses, I believed, even at a very young age, were just brutal. I didn't think it was effective. And I thought there was a better way from probably the age of seven. Meeting the Queen and having international exposure for my concepts like that was a dream. And I was 54 years old and I really had sort of thought that my career was winding down and that if I had a chance to bring my concepts to the world, it would be only slightly to the world. Her Majesty come to England and to introduce her to my work. It was overwhelming to me. I hadn't had that kind of acceptance at any point in my life. I was just at the end of my racing career and looking for a way forward for myself that was going to be really meaningful. And he was looking for a way to bring his work to a great deal more people. And I actually became the first teacher, obviously apart from himself, of these methods worldwide. And it all started in England. And now these courses have reached America and all over the world. You had a student that came up to you and said, I'm getting ready to go ride bucking horses. Mm -hmm. Might you say, are you sure you're ready for this? I don't want her to do this. I don't want her to do it at all. I've been there. I know how dangerous it can be. And oftentimes horses will seem to be really placid and doing well. That's when you're getting your work right. But one mistake and it's lights out time. And working with the wildest of wild horses can be so dangerous, I, I don't want her to do it. If that came from some people, I might ignore it or take it as a challenge. 
But because I respect Monty so much, it has worried me. And I'm committed now. I, I, I want to do this for the people involved, but for myself as well. I do realise what I'm letting myself in for, and I'm going to approach it as responsibly and carefully as I possibly can. It's essential that she gets to trust the right. A project of such magnitude can only be executed with strong and dynamic teamwork. Ian Vanderberg has proved to be a keystone in Kelly's work, the driving force behind her demonstrations. Grant Bazin completes the team. His superior riding skills and sensitive touch complement Kelly's skill of horse whispering. They're a formidable team. I don't know how it's going to turn out. I mean, you can be sure I'm going to do the best that I can, but there aren't any guarantees. It's not like an event that I normally do where the domestic horse turns up in a trailer and I'm asked to work with it. I don't even know if I'm going to be able to find these horses to get them in an enclosed area. I've, I've got to go out there, first of all, really, to, to discover these things. Travelling from London to Namibia is arduous. The flight to Johannesburg, South Africa, is a lengthy 12 hours, with a two-hour connecting flight to Uppington. From there, another five-hour car trip takes you through the border, straight to the horses. I came to Africa not to save the horses. They're doing perfectly well without me. I came to see what I could learn from them and take back to my students to test myself in a way. I've been working with unhandled horses at home. I've thought I've done pretty well, but they've always um, had human contact before. We've deliberately come to somewhere where the horses don't even see tourists. I just wanted to see what the real untouched horse was like. But that's, that's going to be the least stressful for the horses, isn't that's, it? This is the least stressful. So that's what we'll do. Yeah, no question. When I first thought about catching wild horses, like everyone, the first thing that comes to mind is you're going to have loads of horses and round up and you're going to lasso them and all the rest of it. But why should I take that approach now when I've never done that in England? Um, I actually thought through it the way that I would at home and thought the first thing is to get your horse in a nice, safe, enclosed area. How can you get that horse in that safe, enclosed area? You've got a couple of choices, as I see it. One is to chase them in, but then there's the worry they can go everywhere. Or we could get the horses to want to come in. And what's more ideal? They always come to this watering hole. So we built the boma or corral around the watering hole so that we could gently bring the horses in and work with them from there. Can we drape something over that so that the Yeah, because the shade knitting is going to come right oh, across right, the fence. Yeah. The fence is not going to Because I just bet they don't even see wire properly, do they, these horses? Um, no. No, uh, I, be, I won't leave any of... I don't... I won't push them into anything that's just wire. Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. it is difficult for them to see. On a previous trip to South Africa, Kelly met Telani Hreling. A zoologist by profession, Telani has dedicated most of her life to studying the feral horses of Namibia, yeah. also being one of the first to document their existence. Her undying love and deep-set knowledge will prove to be of cardinal importance in Kelly's desert endeavor. I'm going to have my office floor done in this. On arrival in Namibia, work begins on the construction of the boma. God save them for your finger. <laughs> I've been riding for Kelly on demonstrations now for um, roughly two and a half, three years. Um, so basically where Kelly goes, <laughs> I go. What sort of bird are you then? And are you a wild bird? While work continues, midday temperatures soar, often reaching upwards of 45 degrees Celsius. The presence of a rock kestrel is a welcome distraction from work. And then, seemingly from out of nowhere, a herd appears on the horizon. I can't believe this. This is just so incredible. I was thinking we were just going to be building pens today. I'd almost forgotten that they were actually around and to think that on our first day they're approaching is just incredible it's just so exciting there's some really interesting things going on over there I'm not pretending to understand exactly what's happening I think it's a bachelor uh, impinging on the herd and the stallion pushing him out but it's almost like synchronized horse work uh, as they're trotting around 
together, one pushing the other away. And when the Stalin comes back, the other one comes back with him. Stringent competition for dominance among the stallions is a distinguishing behavioral pattern, setting these horses apart from their domesticated cousins. None of the team members has ever before witnessed this behavior. He's beautiful, though, and to think they've come so close to us on the first day. Uh-oh. It's extraordinary the energy they must use up in these fights as well. Kelly identifies a bachelor stallion. Later, with an inherent bond developing between them, her hopes are raised, as are her fears. His antics earn him the nickname Muddy Waters. We can see how much injuries these horses have got. They're like atlases, road maps yeah. <laughs> on their bodies of scars and, yeah. you know, healing tissue from previous fights. Mm -hmm. It's hard not to talk in cliches in surroundings like this. Awesome has become a, a word that's overused, and yet I can't think of any other expression to describe these surroundings. I've never seen anything like it in my life. It's just so vast. It's incredible. It seemed to me like it could be a good omen for the whole trip. If the birds will let you stroke them, perhaps we could get near the wild horses as well. Are you all right? A teacher I know said that every compassionate hand is a healing hand, which is a lovely thought. We're very different. Talani's the brilliant scientist. I'm a horse lover. I'm a very practical person, but I'm a pet owner as well. Talani is very different, like when we talk about the wild. She says about how animals have to die and how that's nature. And though I totally understand that, of course, part of me looks at this fabulous landscape and thinks, hmm, I'd rather keep my horse at home. Having said that, it's a wonderful opportunity for me to study horses here in the wild. So who do you think the black one is that's leading? Mr. Stella. That's the Stella. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's the Stella. So if there's two mares and foals following him, but they're not actually part of his herd, he doesn't just want to adopt them. You mean me? Um, pushing them away. They're coming in to drink now. They've finally taken the decision. This is the stallion's favorite group or his own group, and he's checking they're all right. He's at the back. Now, who's behind him, Talani? That's his group behind him. So the who's the first group is the, the group without a stallion. OK. How many times would they drink in a week? About every 30 to 40 hours. So that's three to four times a week. Yeah. A domestic horse, you'd be up before the welfare people if you left him without a drink for more than two hours. So it's extraordinary. In an effort to grasp the impact of the horse's surroundings, Kelly and her team venture off on a drive. They start along the knife-like border of the Orange River, the key divide between South Africa and Namibia. The sheer scale of desolate arid plains is difficult to comprehend, the rough terrain challenging even the boldest of safari adventurers. This scenery is just extraordinary because you see pictures in books and things, but it just doesn't prepare you at all. I'm in complete awe. It's just awesome. Who said that all of life is could be in a grain of sand? It's beautiful. Of course, this is one of the biggest diamond areas as well. Down there for a while.
Their trip ends on a ridge overlooking the Boma. Kelly decides to walk down one of the many paths the horses have trodden on their way to the waterhole. As luck would have it, Muddy Waters is close by, surely a sign of these two souls' imminent union. This is great, but that curtain looks too wide for me. We're not Later that same the afternoon, final inspection of the Boma reveals some logistical concerns. Grant and Kelly raise doubts about the construction of the keyhole pen. Will this game-capturing technique successfully apply to the wild horses without putting them at any unnecessary risk? You can see we've messed it up because we've had a trial run. We haven't messed it up, but yeah. just that one curtain ring. But it goes like a parachute. And we're thinking... The wind is. Yeah. What do you think? Well, there's not much one can do about the wind, but <laughs> one can try to make uh, the curtain less blowable. Right. What, splits in it in some Yeah, way? I think that's a good idea. Okay, that would be great. The most important thing is it's got to be safe for horses. Wonderful as they are, seem to have very little sense of self-preservation. If there's wire, they'll get cut in it. If there's a horse that's going to kick them, they'll go and find it. But if we're putting new things up that they haven't seen before, we are so responsible for their safety. And we can't take chances. We've got to be perfectionists as far as we can. The morning after construction has been completed, Kelly and her team position themselves at the entrance of the Boma, the perfect vantage point from which to observe the approaching animals. A group of mares, but I think the lead horse here is a stallion. He's got some scarring on. Contrary to our belief that the alpha mare was the mare, yeah. was the individual that took horses yeah. to the water drop. That's right. They've definitely seen far more the stallion led here rather mm. than uh, the alpha mare. This is, this is your, this is Muddy Waters. Yeah. It is? Muddy. Yeah. <laughs> I tell you what I'd love to do is just stand up and see oh, listen, what he yeah, does. Yeah, I think you should stand up and see. See, see how it will stay here. I wonder if he can jump. Should we just haze him just for the fun? It'll be interesting to see if he makes a dash past us. Yeah. To be back with his mates. Edging muddy towards the holding pen, the imminent dangers involved in such an operation resurface. Guarding against any signs of stress or fear, Kelly and Ian press slowly forward. <laughs> Are you okay there, Ian? So you're, you've got quite a lot of responsibility there, because I'm going to try and get this side, look in his left eye, to turn him. Right, so I'll turn him that way. You hear the curtains now. Give him a little space. Okay. The way I want to work with Muddy now is to be as least stressful to him as possible and we've already watched the interaction with the horses and we've watched how they approach us and what they do is they come quite close then they go away then they come a little bit closer and then they come away this was caught by western people years ago this advance and retreat method and the extraordinary thing is if you can just get it get it right that after a while you'll push a bit closer, you'll move away and they will start to look at you and they can almost start to follow you. Slowly but surely, Kelly starts building her relationship with Muddy. Knowing his love for mud baths, she attempts to make his environment as familiar and comfortable as possible. But will Muddy respond? Think how itchy you must feel. Yes. He's really loving that. It's such a pleasure to give this to a horse. I'm going to remove myself because it's. I just want to go straight up to him. I'm going to come out now. Just give him some time on his own to think. 
I had two phone calls just before I left from people that know these sort of horses very well, just telling me, making sure I know that if a horse like this is trapped uh, and they perceive that I'm a predator, they will attack. We've seen the horses attack each other, the stallions fight each other. So although I don't instinctively feel he's going to come for me, there's these warning bells in my head rem reminding myself of these calls. As you can see, he's standing nice and quiet. He's resting a hind leg. Mm. His head's low and, you know, he's very relaxed. As the afternoon passes, Kelly remains focused. Her aim is to create a strong bond of trust between herself and Muddy. She continually talks to him, giving him the opportunity to familiarize himself with her voice. Deliberate eye contact is forbidden, a sign that horses perceive as threatening and aggressive. Good boy. What's your name? Muddy Waters. Judging the horse's growing bond of trust, Kelly decides to move on to the next level. She hopes to finally make physical contact with her companion, a significant turning point in this project. Knowing the possible dangers associated with such a feral animal, all necessary safety precautions are put into place. Yeah, in a way, and also if he bites my arm. What I'm going to do now is see if I can go in and touch him. Obviously, it's going to be quite hard for me to get close enough initially, but I want to see if they'll let me touch him with this pole, see if he'll touch it with his nose. I want him to get comfortable with me, but if he gets cross, I'd rather he had a little bite at this pole. When he stops, I'm going to come away. You see how he's biting? And he looks pretty concerned. Horse whispering is a refined science the element of trust forming the base of a human-horse relationship. Muddy Waters should experience all Kelly's actions and doings through both eyes. This is merely an adaptation of how horses assess possible predators in their natural state. A false arm is used to make initial contact, an obvious safety precaution, and the stepping stone to Kelly's planned future advances. He's very close now. I think he might give me a little nudge. He's just scratching an itchy bit there. Well. It's no good. This was part of the dream, really touching. My wild Namibian horse, touching his neck with my hands. And what a rough, battle-scarred neck it is. But he's accepting me, and I feel he's really happy for me to be here. And that's what I wanted most of all. It's a wonderful feeling. I just can't believe it. After Muddy allows her to touch him, Kelly carefully ties a makeshift halter around his head. This will allow her to teach him how to respond to pressure and is easily removed should he panic. A little bit of whoopsie. A bit cross there. Nice. Good boy. Once the horse is in the pen, I have to make an assessment. Now, the horses in England that I work with uh, are mostly halter broken. And if a horse is halter broken, what I'll do is a process that I was taught by Monty Roberts called the join-up process. It's sort of quite a set pattern and you can push the horse away, he'll give certain signs and you invite the horse in. And that works very, very well for a great deal of horses. It's a wonderful way to create a bond of trust and respect, but with everything, it's got to be the individual horse. These horses were not halter broken. I didn't want to push them away at all because they might find that confusing at this very early stage. They might find that a little bit frightening or even a little bit threatening. 
so I just read the horse really moment by moment and to keep encouraging him to keep saying to that horse in his language, you know, if you come to me, everything's nice, um, and, and getting him to, to mellow and feel really comfortable to me. At the end of the day's session, Sheila, the accompanying vet, inspects Muddy to determine his age and condition. I think his overall health is good. He's got a nice coat, he's got a shine in the sun, he's well covered. Uh, you can't expect him to be really fat in, mm -hmm. in, under these circumstances. And I, uh, the, the bite marks that he's got here are superficial, so mm -hmm. they're not going to affect his general health. I want to look at his teeth because in horses you can age them fairly accurately up until about 10 from their teeth. And I think his last pair of incisors have just come into wear, which would make him coming up six. It's terrifically rewarding for me to make the connection with horses, and it never fails to amaze me. As the light fades, the day's events seem almost unreal. However, in this remote wilderness, nothing is certain. The team are aware that they must not get overly confident. Pretty excited about seeing the other horses galloping by. That other stallion was pretty determined to, to keep his mares away from Muddy. I, he heard him calling and then the stallion was really snaking, putting his head low to the ground and really pushing those other ma his mares away to, to keep him separate from him. He obviously sees him as a danger. Little does he know he's now my horse. See how he's following me now? with barely any pressure on the line at all. Oh, wrong there. Good boy. What I'd like to get him to do is be able to, to follow me without anything on his head at all. Good boy. That's a good boy. Okay. The final stage is to see if Muddy will accept a rider. But first, it's time to see how he will react to a saddle. I think I'll stay with this rope, thank you. What's this thing? You're such a good horse, aren't you? Eh? You're such a good boy. Now I've got to see what he thinks of this. I hope he doesn't start imagining it's some sort of leopard or something. Good boy. That's a good boy. I don't know that I've ever had a horse this quiet to start before. Good boy. Okay. What I'll do is I'll, I'll just do some long lining just to see if I've got some steering and if I can get him to move a little bit. This, this is called a hobble which ties the stirrups together. In the old-fashioned methods of horse training, the hobble was used to tie a leg up so that they were just on three legs, so they couldn't kick you or anything. But here, I'm just using it for very mild reasons. Good boy. That's very good. Well, this is good, yeah. I'm using the kiss noise as well, just to move him on. You can see his ears are back. He's not that comfortable with it. But obviously, it's a strange new feeling. Kelly's encounter with the desert horses exceeded um, all expectations. On the spur of the moment, yeah, Kelly decides off. that she herself, and not Grant, will be the first person to ride muddy. Grant remains close at hand, dispensing his advice and support. Okay, can you tell me if you're happy? Yeah. Okay, just slide your foot in. Keep it smooth as... Am I right Yeah, nice and clear with that leg. Keep it clear. Okay. 
put my foot on the other Don't side. Reach down with your hand, Penny. Just push it out with your leg. All right. That's it. Now just lift your hand. If it looks like bucking, lift your hands very. Yeah, your hand on the reins very high. Yeah. Okay. I'm riding quite short here. I've got to enjoy the view. I can see two bachelors coming this way. It's great. Good boy. Thank you. Wow. What a feeling. Good boy. No, that was absolutely great. I couldn't stop smiling because, well, for him to accept me so quickly and I've taken everything as slow as I can. And this is just the, the second morning and he's just so comfortable with me, so trusting. And even when those two other bachelors came over, he's not worried at all. He's very happy here. So I was absolutely delighted. It was super. Yeah, it's amazing that a, you know, a wild animal can accept a human being so easy. I don't usually ride them myself, but I couldn't resist this time. What we've got to do now is go and find a horse for Grant as well, and we can ride off into the sunset together. Yeah, sounds like fun. <laughs> I just need a bigger horse, though. <laughs> the timing is perfect. The same two bachelors from earlier on are still doing the rounds. Tensions seem to soar most often with the arrival of newcomers, and this morning seems to be no different. Another small herd joins the two loners, the stallion, mare, and foal. The stallion immediately expresses his dominance, justifying his rigid claim to power. It takes the arrival of another old loner to settle the dust, slowly making his way to the drinking trough. He is soon joined by the younger of the two bachelors, a prime candidate for Grant's own challenge. The decision is made and the curtain is drawn, enclosing the two horses in the boma. Super. What do we do? Not it. The original plan then, never included so training more than one stallion. Before training on the second horse can begin, another holding pen needs to be constructed for Muddy. I'm going to take you to another room. And oh, we've got you a friend. We've got you a friend to come and stay with you. Come on. Good boy. Come, Mud. That's a good boy. I wouldn't get too close, or otherwise it means we've got to give bigger gap for them to run through. He's lovely, isn't he? Oh, he likes you, Grant. Naturally, these horses have had no human contact whatsoever and remain yeah, fairly right. skittish. The first attempt to guide them into the holding pen fails when the chosen bachelor manages to break free. There's nowhere else to let him out. Right, take the pressure off if he moves. You need to come up, Kelly. You, 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 well, you, you say that, I think you're getting too close. I think you want to give them a bit more space. Let them, let them make their own decisions. With nature's perfect timing, a dust devil swirls across the boma, creating confusion and heightening the already tense and oh, unpredictable time, situation. Ah, that stick's blown over there. The dust devil drives the horses towards the holding pen. It seems fit to name the horse after such a fateful occurrence. Perhaps this is just another omen of the natural chain of events that seem to be unfolding. Boy. Once inside the holding pen, the horses are quickly separated, making the experience as stress-free as possible. The older bachelor leaves in the direction of the water trough, and once the draw curtain is opened, heads off. No worse for his experience. 
a relieved team officially named Grant's Stallion. It's between um, Bruce and, um, oh, should we call him Dust Devil? Yeah. So once again, I'm just going through the same safety procedures. I'm going to put this back protector on. I keep reminding myself, just because the first horse went so well, this horse is different. Every horse is an individual. Just, you know, going to go carefully here. Kelly's work with Dusty gets underway in much the same fashion as with Muddy. A sound foundation of trust needs to be laid. Her first step is to offer him water, gradually allowing him to adapt to her presence. Dusty. He likes to put his foot in and tip it all out. It's incredible. It's very relaxed. His eyes seem quite... Because I think, Kelly, he is more likely to run away yeah. than attack you. Yeah. Because of his immaturity. Yeah. You know, he hasn't got that dominance as some of, some of the stallions would yeah. have. Fairly... Ian's warning that Dusty might prove to be feistier than Muddy weighs heavily on Kelly's mind. She returns to the centre of the circle, knowing that this gives her the unique advantage of always being able to move towards him. It's what he thinks I'm going to do to him which is frightening, because what I'm actually going to do to him isn't frightening at all. What I'd like him to do, I'll give him the opportunity to do, is just touch this with his nose. A horse's curiosity makes him want to explore. Adopting this, Kelly implements the technique of advance and retreat. This way, the horse is by no means forced to complete a task. Instead, he does so intuitively, satisfying his own inquisitive instinct. I'd like him to reach out and touch this now. I think he'll get bold enough soon. And he's pretending he's interested in those droppings, but... Good boy. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah, you got him. Because you're doing great, you know. But it's... You, you don't notice it, because it, it does make the two steps forward. Yeah. That's you know? why it's great having you there, because... Yeah. You can see the changes in his eye. I'm so deliberately not looking at him. Mm. That's it, he's come forward. Into right. it. Dust devil. Dust devil. And are you going to be a stallion with your own herd one day? This is his first five minutes of human contact in his whole life, and he's just amazingly responsive. He might find it pretty scary me touching the side of his neck. I'll come away and give him some time to think again. Ian carefully monitors Dusty's body language, aware that at any moment he could turn on Kelly. He also watches for signs of subservience, licking and chewing, the expression of the eyes and the position of the again. ears. Gloves are fine, but sometimes you want to touch things with your hand. First time I thought it must be a fluke. Now I know it's really, really for real. Good boy. I come away. So you're going to be Grant's horse. Good boy. <laughs> this is where 
he might find things a bit tricky to start with as I put a little bit of pressure on him. He suddenly feels somebody else pull you. I know. So I'm just wishing here the rope whoa, was a couple of feet longer. Good boy. That's it. Just come to stop and facing you straight away. Good boy. That's ideal. And always work at an angle. Good boy. And always release the pressure as soon as he's done what you've asked. Horses are just like humans, really. That if you want to fight and battle, they'll fight and battle back. But if you want to find a way of working together, you can usually manage that as well. And then gradually, gradually, you wait. That was great. Yeah, always that step forward, isn't it? Yeah, that was really nice. Dusty. He is such a quick learner, this horse. Okay, okay. Ian's role outside the pen is crucial. He carefully watches Kelly's progress with Dusty. This is especially important as Kelly okay. cannot make direct eye contact with the horse. This horse will definitely benefit from the, the overnight break. Tomorrow you will see enormous progress. And then, you know, where does this progress suddenly come from? You know, this kind of latent learning the horse does. The fact Kelly makes it easy because her hands are so giving. If you were to apply too much pressure when the horse was panicking with that rope, the horse could have reared up. If he wouldn't have given again the pressure, it could have flipped over and which would have been far more dramatic, but we, Kelly never goes there. You know, she stops it happening in the first place, yeah? Every time I work with horses like this, young horses, nervous horses, it seems like a mini miracle. But these horses I know have never been touched by human hands before. They've barely seen humans. That's why we've come out here particularly rather than anywhere else on the face of the earth. And the response has just been remarkable. They're so gentle, they're so accepting. I'm still drawing conclusions, but I guess it's because they've never been ill-treated by humans, and so they're accepting us totally on face value on what we do. With the work on both horses well underway, thoughts turned their release back into the wild. Tilani will need a lead horse to guide the others out of the boma. The nearest farm with available geldings is some distance away, so Tilani undertakes the journey, checking on the horse's upkeep and negotiating a deal with the farmer. Are we overdoing you on the water? Hmm? Good boy. Good boy. The pace of the process is determined by the horse's ability to learn and accept new challenges set by the whisperer. They also respond more positively after a period of rest, the so-called latent learning. Dusty's attitude and demeanor improved considerably overnight, much to the team's satisfaction. Good boy. He's just a, a lovely baby. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. So if anything is the slightest bit uncomfortable, I want him to know that if he just faces me, I'm here as a comfort for him. Good boy. That's a good boy. Good licking and chewing there. This is really good, isn't it? That's wonderful. Yeah. And each time he's letting me come up to him a little bit yeah. more keenly. It's very interesting to me as well how these horses will let you touch their ears like this. Because I've known lots of horses in Britain that you can't touch their ears. 
and that's because somebody to make them stand still has grabbed their ear really tightly and held them and then the horses never let anyone go near their ears again which again is such terrible bad horsemanship what are you going to think about this saddle has it got water in it can you eat it will it bite you now this is a saddle pad right and horses wear them okay to go under their saddles there we go so i'm going to put this here good and this is a saddle now it's a racing saddle but i don't want you to think that you've got to start doing a lot of racing okay it's not a predator not gonna eat you good boy if he barks and he thinks it's a predator that's perfectly normal he's most likely to do this as he moves away and he, he'll perceive that he, that it's tightening on him yeah his oh. eyes opening up he's more awake now a horse's natural instinct for flight allows them time to that's assess the situation once Dusty is assured that no danger exists, he turns towards Kelly, a sign of acceptance. Okay, come in then. Come around. That's what I was waiting for. Yeah. Good. Now the aim is that you move forward in front. It's different from what we were doing before. Oh, we must have done this before. <laughs> Good boy. Now, I'm going to try and make a right-handed turn, which is going to be difficult for him, because he, he's got to follow where the line's coming from. He's got to yield. Can you see? That's it. That's it. He hasn't learnt that yet, and it's up to me to teach him. I'm going to go for a turn now. I'm going to look in this eye and push him away and pull the other rein. Good boy. That's it. Well done. Great. That was nice. He's a very quick learner. See if we can do a right turn, Dusty. To the right, to the right. Super. Dusty's response to stimuli from either side tests his willingness to turn either left or right. Similarly, when pressure is applied to both sides simultaneously, Puss learns to step backwards, effectively teaching him how to stop. What do you think about riding him? Yeah. Oh, have, have I got to do them all, you know? <laughs> As the official team rider, Grant must first make a connection with Dusty before he climbs into the saddle. Okay, I'll let him get to know you for a while. I'll let you do all the... Grant carefully spreads his weight across the saddle, making sure that Dusty sees him through both eyes. Before accepting Grant as his rider, the horse needs to realize that he holds no threat a process only possible once he's observed him from both hemispheres of his brain. Convinced that Dusty is comfortable, Grant slides his leg over and puts his foot in the stirrup. Good boy. Good boy. You seen the herd? Yeah. Just... They all want Here, Dusty. Yeah. You're absolutely amazing, and it's just proof that, um, how much man abuses horses because we've taken this animal from the wild and in a very short space of time he's accepted to be riding him with no you know no threat of bucking you know or adverse reaction you know we're dealing with horses every day uh, around the world the man is abused and you know me and Kelly have to work so hard you know just for me to stay in the saddle and we can take a horse from the wild and, you know, and be able to ride it in such a short space of time <laughs> Oh! <laughs> Before we came here, we assumed it would be very difficult, that the horses would be rearing up, backing away, difficult to catch, difficult to put head collars on. A really reactive type of horse. But what we found with a nice, gentle approach, Kelly made enormous progress in a very short period of time. We've clearly seen that the horses can be ridden 
can be handled and in the right using the right methods it's very non-confrontational but these horses are so at tune with nature here that they've got to be released really it's definitely better to let them loose and observe them because we can still learn a lot from these horses that we can pass on in our own horsemanship dealing with horses day to day inevitably the release of the horses draws near again thoughts turn to the best possible method in which to accomplish this kelly decides they should ride out bareback thereby lessening the added complication of removing the saddle the role of the lead rider talani now becomes crucial as the zoologist she has a better understanding of how the horses will react in the open felt when kelly and grant were riding out we could see another herd coming approaching when we rode out the the boma um both me and kelly were a little bit apprehensive we you know we could see other horses approaching and we wasn't quite sure you know how our horses were going to react muddy now don't you start getting into any fights if i'm going to let you go are you are you ready to get off there's a group right over there though I hope they're not going to go and get straight into a fight. Oh, well, Muddy. You be a good boy now. You be a good boy. You go and find some of your own mares now. Okay. Find some of your own mares. You ready, Grant? Bye, Muddy. Good boy. I didn't want to let them go at one stage because I could see the black stallion coming and I I thought, oh, Muddy's going to get in a fight and what's going to happen. And sure enough, Muddy goes straight in. To, and I can see now that he's actually quite an aggressive little soul. I mean, that's why he's got all the bites on him. One of the bachelors went up, confronted the stallion. There was a short, sternly, not the body language, not the posturing. Muddy's behaviour took everyone by surprise. The two horses paired up, Muddy placing himself between Dusty and any danger, bonded through a shared experience. Horses can be our greatest teachers and this experience has proved to me once and for all that we've got to work with the nature of horses. We mustn't try and battle with them, that's not the way at all. I've touched the lives of these horses only briefly but they've touched my life a great deal more. Perhaps one of the best things to come from this whole experience is that I might be able to improve the lives of horses in many different areas now.